Hello and welcome to the Road to Fantasy Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Smolsky. Joint, as always, by my co-host, Scott Pianowski. Uh, busy, busy weekend, busy day for us ahead of us today, Scott. Oh man, a lot of comings and goings. Uh, this is one of those weekends, there's some fab weekends where you don't do much. You're like, okay, I'm good here. This is one of those Sundays where I, I felt like I could have spent the entire day trying to find <laughs> what I need to do to my roster. So, yeah. and also we're deep enough into the season that you have a better sense of what you need, what you're sitting on. Uh, the stats have a little bit more meaning. Uh, mm-hmm. We're always talking about at what point in the season is there relevance to stats? What has stabilized? I think we're at a point now where we can start making better decisions. So yeah, a lot, a lot to unpack. Let's start unpacking. Yeah, there were um, there were a couple guys that you know to your point that I dropped that you know I might not have dropped three weeks ago, but we're you know we're de- we're deep enough into the year. Um, so Scott and I are going to do what we do most Mondays. Um, we're going to start with some news and notes, things that happened over the weekend um, or will happen today, um, and then we'll get into some of the biggest uh, risers or, or you know strong performers over the last week, um, and then some guys who were getting dropped uh, in the most Yahoo leagues, and try to talk through whether Scott and I agree with. Uh, it being time to move on from those players. Um, we'll start with the trade because we don't normally get trades um, at this point in the in the in this, the regular baseball season. Um, and trades, not just like, you know, I saw that there was an athletic article on, you know, what type of trades tend to get made. And it's usually like for backup in May. And it's usually for like backup catchers or, you know, guys who are past their prime. Um, we don't see what we saw which was Luis Arias, who is a two-time batting champion, get traded from the Marlins to the San Diego Padres uh, for reliever Wu Sukko, who the Padres signed um, in the offseason, um, and then three minor league prospects led by Dylan Head, who was the 25th overall pick in the 2023 draft for the Padres. Um, also outfielder Jacob Marseille, who was um, – or. Mars? I'll have to look that up as we're going through it. Um, I think it might be Marseille, who was the most uh, recent MVP of the Arizona Fall League. And then first baseman outfielder uh, Nathan Martorella, um, who there's some mixed reports uh, and from prospect guys, but Chris Clegg, who we had on our Q&A uh, last Tuesday, is definitely a fan of, of Martorella. Um, and so the return for most people seems to be viewed as being a strong return for the Marlins, even if the idea that they got rid of Arias, you know, at the very beginning of, of May seems to be um, confounding some. So I'm, I'm curious how you reacted to the trade before we talk about the fantasy takeaways for it. Yeah, we, we like trades. Um, we, we like trades where it opens up playing time for some new players. And in the case of Arias, it, it frees him from a mediocre lineup to now mm-hmm. he's at the front of a Padres lineup we still like, uh, Manny Machado getting back to full health. So they've been able to finally, the Padres have a lineup that I think is, I think is representative of what they want to put out every day. And they still fancy themselves a playoff team and arise is an interesting guy because he's just a different type of fancy cat, right? I mean, you, you roster him, you're thinking he's going to give you a plus average, not a lot of home runs, not a lot of steals. He does mm-hmm. put the ball and play a lot. Doesn't actually walk all that much, but, San Diego, I mean, with Miami picking up a lot of the Arise contract anyway, I mean, I, it, I, I, I respect what the Padres have done the last few years, right? I mean, the Soto thing didn't work out as well as they thought it would, but they're a team that wants to be good right now, and they they're not a kick the kick the can down the road team. They're like, no, what's we want to we have we have enough good players that we can disrupt the tournament if we get into the tournament. We just have to need to do it. Obviously, Xander Bogarts was off to a really bad start, and maybe he fit more in the middle or, or deeper part of the lineup. Right now, he's probably their number six hitter going forward, so mm-hmm. a little bit nervous about Bogarts. But it's just good to see, e- even if the teams are in opposite directions, right? San Diego's like, be good now. The Marlins are like, uh, we stink. Let's try to be good at a later date. Luis Arise will not be on our next playoff team. Yeah. So it, it's a little bit frustrating to see a team kind of be, okay, yeah, our season is already over, which is kind of what the Marlins are saying. Not like Arise is an MVP candidate or anything, but whenever there's a fantasy trade that immediately, you know, jostles the the value of some players, it gives us some pickup options, which I think it did in this trade. Yeah, it, it gets my juices flowing. Yeah, the it's an interesting trade. You know, I said something on, on Twitter because a lot of people were talking about how it was a, a questionable move for the Marlins. And to me, it's just like, sure, at this at this stage, I could see it. Luis Arias is a terrible defender. 
he's not a good defender at any position. Um, he actively hurts your team in the field. So he's kind of a guy that you have as a DH. But he is a super high contact hitter with minimal power. So if you're putting that at your DH, you better have defenders who also rake at other positions because you're not going to get power out of your DH spot. And most teams do kind of rely on on having a powerful hitter in that part of the order or at first base, corner outfield, etc. The Padres have Jake Cronenworth at first base. He's having a really good year. He's not necessarily a power hitter, right? Um, Xander Bogarts up the middle, not really a power guy anymore. They have uh, Jackson Merrill in the outfield, high contact rate hitter, not really a power guy. So if you look at this Padres lineup, it's Fernando Tatis and Manny Machado are the two guys that could that can leave the yard with consistency. Obviously, some of these other guys will hit home runs, but it's a contact-oriented lineup, and now you're using the DH spot to kind of shuffle things around a little bit. We saw Bogart's DH on Sunday. So to me, it's like, I don't know, man. It's a, it's a little bit of a questionable decision. I understand it makes the Padres lineup better, but I don't know that it gives them something they really lacked. Um, you know, they give up a lot of really good prospects to get Soto and those guys are doing well for the Nationals right now. And so we'll see. I mean, these Marlins, the prospects the Marlins got are young, um, but they this could easily look like a trade that works in the Marlins favor, much like uh, the trade for Pablo Lopez for Luis Arias certainly worked in the Twins favor um, at this stage. You mentioned guys who could benefit from it. I think let me ask you one one really yeah. quick question. I, I don't know that we've talked about this player at all. And he has surged past 50% roster tag in Yahoo, but I feel like I've spent my entire life waiting for Jerks and Profar to figure yeah. it out and have that season. He yeah. he's had man, he's played for everybody, right? Texas and Oakland, the Padres and the Rockies, mm-hmm. and back to the Padres. He's played all over the field. He's missed a full season with injury. At one point, he was the number one prospect in baseball. Now he's age 31 season. He's off to a 344, 430, 533 start. The walk and strikeout rate is almost even. And we, you know how I love talking about guys who do that. Mm-hmm. Nobody, nobody thinks he's a 182 OPS plus player. I get it. But is Jerkson Profar somebody we're going to like have? He's going to have fantasy relevance all season. What's your take on it? It's look, he's not th- this good because anybody playing sure. this far over their established level of production, we're just going to. Look at him. So, okay, it's easy to say regression. Okay, I get that. But my question to you, Eric, is what is he going to regress to? The the player he has been for much of his career. Um, you know, I I have profile in a lot of leagues, and I'm really happy with with what I'm getting from him. Um, I I look under the hood, and it's like nothing, nothing has really changed. He's got a barrel rate just under 6%. He's a career 4.1% barrel rate guy. He has a 42% pull rate. He is a 42 career 42% pull rate guy. He's a has a 35% fly ball rate. He's a career 34.8% fly ball rate guy. He currently has a 28.6% O swing or chase rate. He's a career 28.4% O swing guy. He currently has a 92% zone contact rate, and he's an 89.6% zone contact guy. Last one, career. He is currently rocking a 7.8% swinging strike rate, career 7.7% swinging strike rate hitter. It's basically the same as he's been for his entire career. The issue right now is he's making a little bit more contact in the zone, Um, And his line drive rate has really spiked over his career norms. And I think that's why um, you're seeing a 344 batting average, which is coming with a 381 BABIP, by the way. Um, And so he's just making a little more contact in the zone than he normally does. His foul tip percentage or foul percentage is down. So pitches that I guess he normally would foul back or miss in the zone he's now getting good contact on but it's not necessarily because of like a glaring change in anything he's doing i think this is a hot streak for profar um i think if you have the ability to sell high i think this is a great time to do it i don't think people are going to buy high on a 31 year old in the middle of a great run but i think you keep him in your lineup obviously Mm -hmm. because he's performing really well i just don't know that 
it's going to be any at the end of the season. I think you might look up and he's he's hitting 260 and he's got, you know, 12 home runs, 15 home runs. And you're thinking, I'm super I'm glad I had him Mm -hmm. um, for whatever time I had him for. But I don't think you're he's necessarily a guy you're going to be holding all year long. Yeah, but for now. I think he, he comes under the force hold heading where sure. Yeah. It'd be lovely if you could sell high on, on jerks and pro far to who, right. Right. He's just exactly. the type of player your opponents are going to look at skeptically. At least the expected average is over 300 the expecting slugging the 533. We can't take seriously, but expected slugging of, of 444. If you told the Padres they were going to get an OPS player in like 750, 760, 770, who ostensibly could move around the diamond. I know he's kind of settled on one position right now, but I mean, they're, they're thrilled that, right. and, and also with Profar, if you've gone through the Profar experience, it's usually like, is he in the lineup today? Is he in the lineup tomorrow? He doesn't have that problem right now. He's in the lineup every day and part of yeah. a plus lineup. So some guys, and will, and will, and, will be. and it seems like it's easy to say, Oh yeah. Yeah. Of course you sell high on this guy. Of course you buy low on this guy. Some guys are just forced holds. I think Profar is one of those forced holds. Agreed. The guy to potentially buy from this is on the Marlins side. Mm-hmm. It looks like Vidal Bruhan is going to get a little more playing time. Vidal Bruhan and Nick Gordon um, seem like the beneficiaries here. I'm not as into Nick Gordon just because he's not really performing all that well. Bruhan has two things going for him. First of all, he's got a 9.7% strikeout rate in 26 games this year and an eight, sorry, 9.7% walk rate, an 8.1% strikeout rate. He is a high contact hitter, he has stolen bases. In the past, 45 steals in 2021, 31 steals in 2022, 22 steals um, in minimal games in 2023 because he spent a lot of time on the bench in Tampa Bay. Um, So this is a guy who won't hit for the batting average that Arias will, but has been, you know, like a 270, 280 hitter in the minors and has way more speed. So if you're in deeper formats, this is a guy who could be a solid speed uh, player for you i don't think you're getting like crazy upside here but he was a prospect of some note and so you know it might be worth taking a gamble on um, sure it, it qualifies the three infield positions too which is really yes. flexible and in a time where you may have all sorts of injuries and you're just trying to field a competitive lineup when i can grab three positions from any player and is it interesting that when they trade Arise, you know, Bruhan, who's a contact maestro, he, he can run more than Arise would, but it's just funny that he's the type of player who steps into playing time now. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but I, I like I like it in deeper formats. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked what I saw from a, another prospect, Christian Scott, in his debut with the Mets over the weekend. Um, it was pretty, pretty electric stuff. Um, he, you know, at the end of the day, the stat line doesn't blow you away, um, but I'm curious what your what your thoughts were on the outing in general. Um, I was really taken with the the four seam fastball, both the, you know the life on it, the command of it. Um, if you're looking, if you're just going by like by Statcast numbers, you know he had a 35% whiff rate in that game and a 35% CSW. The fastball averaged 95 and a half. Um, he missed bats on it, missed bats with that, and the sweeper, um, and also throws a harder slider. I, I was bidding everywhere on him this weekend and was outbid in a lot of places. Um, but I think he's and I think he's up to stay. I mean, the Mets don't have anybody that should push him out of this rotation. Right. I yeah, you know, as I look at their upcoming starts, it seems like Scott might get the the Braves his next turn, yeah. which you know that will tell us a lot about him. And and then they're there's a possibility maybe he'll get skipped, but what has Luis Quintana shown to um, Jose Quintana? I'm sorry to, right. to maintain a roster spot. And in one of the NL only leagues I'm in, somebody was talking about all their starting pitching. Their whole staff was available, including Quintana. And I'm like, well, that's adorable that they're going to offer Quintana to everybody before he ultimately gets dropped. I mean, right now right. he's pitching in such a, a weird career too. We always thought Quintana was going to step forward and maybe become like a, a down ballot Cy Young guy. I don't think he ever really became that, but uh, it's like Scott, he has the potential. No, nobody's expecting, I know he's in his mid twenties, so maybe they don't have to quote unquote baby him, but you're not expecting, you know, 170, 180 innings from a player like this, but he's going to strike out like 10 or 11 guys per nine. I mean, and he has decent control. He, he looks the part too. He's, he's, he's a horse on the mound. Uh, I wouldn't, if I could avoid it, and I know everybody doesn't have this luxury, even though you might, you go out and you get a player like this in fab, 
you want to use him. I just the Braves still make me nervous. But I think we could be looking at him. There's like five or ten great buying opportunities a year with a young pitcher who may come up and be a strikeout ace right away. And I think Scott has a chance to be one of those guys. You have to focus on the plausible upside, and there's plenty yes. of it here. And and you know we've you know we're seeing somebody mentioned like a lot of the top pitching prospects are either already up or already stashed, right? We saw Jared Jones already come up. Paul Skeens is on right answer. Tons yeah. of tons of rosters already. Um, if you're looking like down the road of who may come up, it's like, I mean, people thought Ricky Tiedemann, he's hurt again. Cade Horton, you know, might not be here till August. So like, if you're looking for who am I going to spend my waiver money on it? It's Scott right now. Um, there's another option which just came up, and is it's Mason Black, who's pitching for the Giants in his MLB debut today, today against the Phillies. This is a guy who not only is not does not seem to have landed in a spot where he has as much guaranteed uh, playing time, just because the Giants, you know, have guys coming back. It, it it should he should get a longer leash, but the Giants have you know liked to mix and match and play lots of other starters. Black is also not the pitcher that Christian Scott is the prospect that he is um he does have a 101 era um in triple a this year and a 0 0.90 whip which is obviously incredible um he has 29 strikeouts in 26 and two-thirds innings there are some concerns just about the the general swing and miss in in black's arsenal he is a four seam sinker pitcher with two types of sliders he has like a harder slider um, and a sweepier slider but you know the for fan graphs for what it's worth believes that his profile is that of a multi-inning reliever in the future just because the the lack of, of true kind of out pitch um obviously he he has looked really good in the minors this feels like a uh less of an upside play than christian scott i think you pick him up if you can and keep him on your bench for this phillies start um, because obviously he's done really good in AAA, but I, I, I wouldn't shock me if he wasn't up for a really long time. No, for sure. There's, there's no floor here, but you like the, the ground ball tilt and obviously the infield they built in San Francisco. And even when the ball's in the air in San Francisco, it's so seldom leaves the park. Then Philadelphia start at Philadelphia is a little bit nerve wracking, but then he's at home for Cincinnati at home for Colorado. That's about as good of a start as you can get if he gets to that Colorado start. So I'm curious Anybody who gets a chance extended in the San Francisco rotation, I realize Keaton Wynn didn't throw well this past week, but mm -hmm. he, he had been really good for like four or five starts in a row. Jordan Hicks has popped as that rare reliever to starter trend. You know, we, we always see starters going to the rotation. It's not as common as you guys make it work the other direction, but maybe Hicks is one of those right answers. Obviously we love Logan Webb. Kyle Harrison's been a little bit of a mixed bag. He was good in his last start. I'm always going to be open-minded to this team. I believe in their process. I believe in their defense. I certainly believe in their park. And even though Black isn't one of these guys, you you, you drop everything. If you're driving, you pull over to pick him up. He's not one of those guys. But I, I would like, if you had the luxury, and you may not with all your injuries, but if you had the luxury to stash him and wait and see what develops here, because of the context around him, I'd be interested in doing that. Yeah, and obviously Scott and I are recording before this Phillies start. So, um, you know, if it's passable, I think he gets he stays up. If it's a Jack Leiter type first start, it may not be a long stretch. So we'll see. And at least he wants to face Trey Turner. It's uh, I, <laughs> uh, who's, who's on one of my uh, and he's on my TGFBI team, which is just I, I'm at that point where you get to like, do I really want seven injured guys on my bench? I think I'm at that point now where I have to start cutting some of these guys. It's not going to be Trey Turner, but um, yeah, what a what a great time to be alive eric yeah turner uh obviously just hit the il with a hamstring issue um you know it, it is not ideal he didn't sound entirely optimistic he said he expects to mix miss six weeks uh and the quote uh from matt gelb who covers the phillies for the athletic um is that trey turner said any return before six weeks would be quote a win so when a player says anytime before six weeks is a win, I think you're assuming closer to eight. Like it could be at least two months before you see Trey Turner. You're not cutting your first round pick. You're not cutting him in an NFBC format. You're just, you're not cutting him. You have to hold um, and you have to find speed elsewhere. You're not going to replace Trey Turner. It's important just to understand that. Like you need to say, okay, what aspect of Trey Turner am I missing the most? And then how can I replace that aspect of what he does 
on the waiver wire, not try to get everything back in, in one player. Um, and so some of the guys we'll talk about later in the show could provide you some of the speed aspect of Trey Turner if you need like the runs or something. I mean, that's what you need to look at your team roster construction and say, what am I going to miss the most for him? And then focus on that one or two categories in the waiver wire. Um, for the Phillies, st- the first two games, it was um, – and Mundo Sosa playing shortstop uh, today on Monday. Interestingly, they're playing Bryson Stott at shortstop. Um, he was their shortstop in 2022 before Trey Turner uh, was traded. And that gets Whit Merrifield in the lineup at second base. So this is something to just keep in mind. Sosa and Merrifield both have not been great this year. So they're not guys you're running to, to pick up. Whit Merrifield was pretty good last year for the Royals. If it does seem like they're going to play Stott at shortstop more often and give Merrifield a chance to be the second baseman, um, I would just keep an eye on how he's performing because he hasn't looked good to start the year. But if he starts to get a feel for it a little bit and is in that lineup regularly, um, that could be a deep league option for people uh, with Merrifield. Right. At age 35, so it's, it's hard to know what he had left. I mean, he did he make the all-star team last year, I want to say. Um, he, he's had an interesting career. For, for years, he was underrated value underrated value for your your team at, on the Royals. Um, covered multiple positions, um, usually hit for a high average. I'd like to think we have one more useful run with Whit Merrifield. And then the lineup, just the way it shuffles through now, Schwarber, still the leadoff man, JT Real Muto slides up to second. I still think Bryce Harper is eventually going to pop. Not, not that you can ever get Harper cheap, but I, I would always be open to paying full price on him. And I, I think Alex Baum is real. I, I Maybe not real to the, what he's at right now, but I, I think right. he could be, he was a first round, what, third overall pick in his draft class. I think this could be the season where he becomes, you know, maybe next year we're looking at him as like a fourth or fifth round player. I like him that much. Yeah. Uh, the other player, big player news to hit the IL, and this isn't in a official, this has not been an official transaction, but the Cleveland Guardians have all but said Stephen Kwan is going on the IL and they're going to call up um, Kyle Manzardo. Again, uh, as we're recording this, that hasn't officially um, been done, so there could be some weirdness going on, but that's what um, apparently is going to happen. Um, Kwan is landing on the the 10-day IL um, and there is some hope that he won't be out for a long time. However, Quan has mentioned that hamstring injuries have been a thing for him in the past, and so he's going to be cautious with the injury. Um, so, you know, maybe it's a two-week thing, maybe it's three. We, we have no idea. Um, but this gives Manzardo a chance. Manzardo is hitting 303 at AAA for the Guardians with nine home runs, 25 runs. 20 RBIs, a 17% strikeout rate, and a 12% walk rate. Um, This is a guy who struggled in 2023, but a lot of people have reported, even though the reports have been kind of vague, um, and that's fine, it's it's somebody's personal life, we don't want to pry too much, but that he was dealing with just some off-field distractions last year, which impacted his performance on the field, got traded from Tampa Bay to Cleveland. Um, But, you know, he's somebody in Tampa Bay in 2022 who proved that he kind of has, he was a a 300 plus hitter, 22 home runs. He a little bit has like a Vinny Pasquantino profile of like, he might be a 20 homer bat at first base, but he's going to run a really high on base percentage. He should hit like, you know, 280, 290. Um, He's shown a lot more pop early on this year. So maybe that power profile is, is coming a little bit more. Um, But just important to understand, like this is a, this is a average hit to an average and hit tool player over a plus raw power player, right? We saw like Joey Loperfido come up last week. It's not that type of, of profile. Um, so I'd be adding Manzardo everywhere, but just acknowledge that your your value is going to come more in terms of average and on base percentage than homers. Right. And I think in the Yahoo Friends and Family League where we just drafted last week, we have bi weekly fab. I, I think. Dalton Del Don threw a, a major piece of his fab chunk on Manzardo so that there's an endorsement for you. I hate to see Quan get hurt. I don't have Quan anywhere, but he's just such an unusual player where it's mm-hmm. it's get the ball and play. He doesn't always have the hardest hit rate, but I believe that his approach actually works. And and I, I want to be open-minded to outliers, guys. You just play a different style of baseball. I think Quan is one of those guys. So, uh, again, no shares here, but sad to see him get hurt. But you outlaw Manzardo. 
there's just, I mean, the, the minor league resident, he's still just 23 too. I mean, it's yeah. just certainly time for him to figure out what he's going to be as a professional player. I would think he's one of the, in a 12 team, 13 team, 15 team mixed league. He's the type of player you want to go attack and get. Yeah. He, he only plays first. Josh Naylor right now is only playing first. I don't know if they're going to move Naylor back into the outfield. He was a fairly average defensive outfielder, but again, you could use those two guys at first base DH and be fine. Um, we just need the guardians to agree that that's how they're going to use those two spots. Um, we got bad news for pitchers as well. Um, two starting pitchers went on the IL this weekend. Joe Musgrove went on the IL with uh, right elbow inflammation. However, the San Diego Padres beat, beat writers have reported that even though it's listed as right elbow inflammation, it's really coming from his tricep. It's triceps tendonitis. Um, and so it's not like a UCL issue or anything like that. So they don't believe it'll be a long stint. Uh, this has a little bit of a feel of not a phantom injury, but like a nice time to just say, hey, the start of the year hasn't been great, even though his last outing was was pretty good. But obviously, like your arm doesn't feel 100 percent. You know, if you have triceps tendonitis, obviously a tricep is a really big muscle in your arm. People, you know, tend not to think about that. And the way that you're throwing pitches, um, it can lead to like discomfort towards the back of, of your elbow. So it might just be shut down, see how we go for a while for Musgrove. Um, I, I think you should still be holding him in leagues where you have him. I, I wouldn't be moving on because I, I think the upside is still of like a top 25 pitcher and they don't think that this is a serious injury. And then same with Nathan Eovaldi, who landed on the IL with a groin injury. Again, you know, injuries are injuries. Eovaldi has been on the injured list a lot, so you don't want to say this isn't a big deal, but it's not an arm injury and the team doesn't seem overly concerned. And so I wouldn't expect Eovaldi to miss that much time he's been pretty solid this year um they need him because you know scherzer's still not back to grom's not back tyler molly's not back like you know he's they're gonna get eovaldi back as soon as they can so to me these guys are both holds and i there's not really much actionable you just hope that they can come back and keep pitching and you also hope that the injury explains why Musgrove wasn't pitching well i mean he leads the major leagues and earn runs allowed mm -hmm. and home runs allowed if I had to have a choice between these two guys, Evaldi is a guy I feel better about. But yeah, this you, you, pitching is thin enough that you, when you have plausible upside on a guy who's hurt, you have to. And I realize it's frustrating because then when they come back, you might need to see a start or two before you feel right. good about activating them again. But I would try to hold these guys if at all possible. I I will go as far as to say if you're lucky enough to be in a um, a decent spot. In your with your IL um, and need pitching, I'd float some offers for Musgrove because I really I still believe in the talent of the pitcher. I've been looking under the hood at what's going on with him this year. Nothing stands out as being a glaring red flag. It's just been that he's not as sharp as normal in terms of like locating pitches and not even globally like locating pitches in certain counts where it's just like that's normally a pitch he gets down more in the zone it's left up a little bit and he's just getting punished for all for the mistakes he's making it's not like he's getting he's just he's getting very unlucky and he's not as crisp as he normally is but there's nothing in the profile that's like hey this is a major concern and so for me rest maybe the arm feels better after this this you know triceps tendonitis and i still think there's an upside of a top 30 pitcher so I, i'm willing to float some offers for musgrove if i if i have an il spot um my question to you is it looks like you know the the rangers have seven games this week including a doubleheader on wednesday so we the rumor is that jack lighter is going to get called up um to get a spot start against the athletics in this first series um, his first start obviously didn't go, even though he struck out the first batter, um, it didn't go really well, allowing uh, seven runs on eight hits um, in three and two thirds. He, he walked three, he struck out three, um, and he allowed uh, one home run. No, he didn't allow a home run, just a lot of hard contact. Are you willing to take a gamble on, on Jack Leiter again because it's the A's or is this like you, we know he's going to be up for a short period of time, and you're just not going to take that risk. Yeah, that's a, that's a seam call for me. That's a borderline call for me. I, I'm pleasantly surprised 
that Oakland is just kind of a mediocre team and not a lookout below horrible mm-hmm. team, which I thought they're, I thought they're going to be where the White Sox are right now or where the Marlins are right now. And they've been plucky. And I realize they've outperformed their Pythagorean, which says they're probably like four or five games lucky right now. But I'm just glad with all the ugliness off the field, you know, where's Oakland going? Does Vegas want them? Is that Sacramento deal going to be even a, a legitimate major league park or, or just, you know, just a joke for a couple of years. Is there any way in the 11th hour they can save the team in Oakland? I'm just glad that they're not where Chicago's at right now, where it's like, Oh my God, they're going to lose 117 games or something like that. But um, lighter, it's a seam call for me. I lean towards no, but I would understand it. If you, maybe if you have um, some wiggle room with the ratio stats, at least you're not worried about him allowing only seven runs against this Oakland roster. There's only like three or four guys you really need to worry about. So Borderline for me, I'd probably lean towards no, but there may be situations where he makes sense for your particular situation. Yeah, uh, I, I agree on that one. Um, we had a reliever go on the IL. Um, it was Evan Phillips. Mm. So Evan Phillips, the Dodgers closer, got his cleat caught um, in like the turf doing some drills before a game um, and hurt his hamstring. And so it seems like a, obviously a serious enough injury that he landed on the IL isn't an arm issue. Isn't like a torn, whatever doesn't seem like he is um, going to be out for an extended period of time. So the question is just who closes for the Dodgers in for the next three weeks, maybe um, is kind of a rough estimate. It seems like uh, the favorite is Daniel Hudson. However, this was a game I was assigned to yesterday um, and in the bottom of the eighth inning, with the Dodgers up four to one, so a save situation, uh, Blake Trinan was called in to face the nine one two hitters. So that's to face Acuna and Ozzy Albies. Um, Hudson did not throw on Saturday, so he's his last game was on Friday. Now it's possible they were holding Hudson back for the ninth inning, and then um, the Dodgers scored a run, and it wasn't a save situation, and so they didn't use him. But it is interesting to note that in his first game off the IL, Blake Trinan was thrust into a pretty major high leverage situation uh, with Acuna and and Albies and got them both out. Um, and so my gut is to say that it might be those two guys splitting some opportunities over the next couple of weeks. Daniel Hudson is somebody who has come out in the past and said that he doesn't really like closing. He's not one of those guys that like really wants to be the guy um, and he'll be the guy if the team needs him. And so to me, I, I just think we've seen both these guys close effectively before. I'd be looking to add both of them in leagues if I needed saves just to see how it shakes out because it's the Dodgers. And so even if they're splitting saves over three weeks, you could get four or five saves from either guy. Right, or, or maybe just the high leverage work leads to some wins. I mean, right. anytime you can get relievers on good teams, Hudson's got the one walk against the 16 strikeouts, which points to a pickup anyway. It's just interesting how old this bullpen is, right? I mean, Hudson in his age 37 season, Trinan in his age 36 season, Joe Kelly, it feels like he's 52. It's, he's age 36, according to baseball reference. And we've seen that Philip that um, Dave Roberts likes kind of committee life. I mean, Evan Phillips since he became a great reliever has been screaming, I'm the guy, there's no reason you need to parcel the saves around. And even last year, he was really the head of a committee. They, they didn't mm-hmm. give saves to other guys. It's only this year that maybe Phillips has become the automatic push button guy in the ninth inning. And you would also think, not that the Dodgers quote unquote need a lot right now, but when trading season kicks in, what do these teams always do? They annex relievers, right? I, I can yeah. see them thinking like, oh, do we want Kyle Finnegan or Hunter Harvey or, or somebody who's a reliever on a good team? We want one of the uh, Detroit relievers. And you know, we'll talk about their bullpen in a little bit because there, there could be some movement there. But uh, they're eventually going to add some. It's, again, an old team in the bullpen right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Phillips, Even Phillips is kind of a sneaky 29. Which Kenley, is a, Kenley Jansen, come on back. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, you, you, Kenley Jansen knows, you know, knows the LA area well. So you could certainly see him there. But there's going to be seven or eight teams that aren't at all in the playoff hunt, even with the expanded people say, well, the expanded playoffs, it makes the trading deadline different because teams don't want to sell. There will be seven or eight teams that are like, and we already saw it with Miami starting to sell a little bit. So there's going to be stuff here. I, I would, if you just want the pitcher with the, I think the more stable skills and the guy who's already been pitching, that would be Hudson. But if I had to bet on who would get more saves in the time that Phillips would miss, if all you cared about was the saves, I think I would lean towards Trinan, but they're both worth rostering because you're tied to one of the best rosters and one of the winningest teams in the American league. That's where you want to make these bullpen bets in the first place. 
It is, yeah. Um, we'll end with some good news. Um, we have some players coming back today. Mm-hmm. Uh, some definitely, some allegedly based on uh, beat reporters. So I'll just say it. Um, this week, we're supposed to see uh, pitchers Nick Pavetta, Justin Steele, and Walker Bueller all activated off the IL. Bueller is set to start today on Monday. It's going to be his first start in over a year, so that'll be interesting to watch. Most of this is not actionable. Almost all of those guys remained on rosters, um, so you can't do anything about it, but it's worth just checking your league and seeing if somebody, you know, in particular with like Pavetta, who's the the least uh, well-known of the three or the least respected oftentimes of those three, to see if they're on the IL. Um, And then Jake Berger and Josh Lowe are also both allegedly coming back from their uh, rehab stints. Um, and so when we get lineups, you know, we'll see if, they, if they're in this week. Um, I personally, you know, am happy with, with hitters. I'm personally happy to throw them right back into the lineup. In particular, guys like Berger and Lowe were like, I kind of know who they are right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know the Rays are going to let Josh Lowe hit against righties in particular in this first week. They'll, you know, probably won't start him against lefties early on. Maybe they won't ever, but we'll see. We'll get to that. Um, but, I, you know, I, the, these guys, they I know what they do. If I held them in my IL spot, I need what they do, whether it's the power of Berger or just the all-purpose skills of Josh Lowe. Um, and so, again, check your wire and see if those guys are there. And if they're on your roster, you know, activate them and, and see how it goes. I, I tend to lean towards keeping starting pitchers on my bench for their first start. Um, but you know, depends on your league type and how desperate you are. Yeah, Bueller was not pitching well in that rehab assignment. He, he, they, they gave him a bunch of turns too. I mean, they took mm-hmm. their time before he came back. Now he, it is, but he's it's tricky, right? He has Miami Monday. That's good. Probably be in a pitch count. He has San Diego on the weekend. That's probably not as good. I have Bueller. I'm generally not a stash guy, but I have a few Bueller shares. I'm going to roll them out there, but hoping that even if he doesn't pitch well. Monday, it might be mitigated by a quick hook. And what's the worst that could happen? He pitches three or four innings. He allows three or four runs. And that's if it goes south. And mm-hmm. because Miami's lineup right now is a substandard major league lineup that you know, maybe it's there's a limit to how much damage they can do with him. But if I was ranking starting pitchers the rest of the way, I really have no idea where Walker would slot. Well, are you thinking top 25, top 40, you know, somebody top, who you at least set and forget? or Top 40 feels fair. Okay. Top 40 yeah. feels fair. I mean, I think the strikeout rate was already coming down before the injury. He hasn't looked really good in the rehab. So I I am not ready to like put him as some ace again. Um, and so I, I don't know that I could put him in the top 25 because that you're kind of talking about like a tier that has like, you know, around the top 25, you're looking at guys like Jared Jones, who probably aren't top 20 if you're ranking the rest of the year, but are pretty darn close. Um, you know, you've got guys. I would who never are, trade Jared Jones for Walker Bueller right now. No, never. no, not at all. Not at all. Okay. What I mean Thanks, is like, sir. I don't know that people would say, Hey, Jared Jones, he's the top 15 pitcher the rest of the way, because like, what is the innings limit? How are they, how often are they going to throw him? What are the win totals? All that kind of stuff. What I mean is just like, I think Bueller fits in more with like guys in like, the starting pitcher 35 to 40 range for me until I can really see what's happening with him the rest of the way. I, I would rank Steele and Pavetta both ahead of Bueller. Oh, um, if I'm just doing, if certainly, I'm just doing a certainly Steele and definitely Pavetta. Let me ask you, I don't think he's on the rundown. John Means looked really good in his first start back, yeah, and he actually he, struck out some he batters. Is, would you rather have Means or Bueller the rest of the way? I'd rather have Bueller. I'd rather have Bueller. Um, I think I'm feeling Means. Let's let you know what let's we'll just get to John Means now because I, I had him on the rundown. For oh, was later. he on the run? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's, okay, that's okay. He's one of the most added players in Yahoo formats. Um, obviously because he came back and made a start this week, and so he gets picked up in a lot of places because he's back and he's healthy. Um, the other reason is that he uh, threw seven innings, um, a lot seven shutout innings, three hits, eight strikeouts. Um, against the Cardinals, right? No, the Reds. Oh, the Reds, who were in Cincinnati, too, which on the surface was like, this is a terrible play. Don't start John Means. The Reds are, I mean, they got diced up by Dean Kramer, too. Like, the Reds are not hitting at all right now. Um, I, I unquestionably Means looked great on Saturday. And so I advocate for picking him up everywhere because how can you see what he did on Saturday and not say, hey, that's a guy I want on my roster my concerns are 
that in the ex- except for his changeup being two miles an hour harder than it was in the past, the arsenal looks pretty similar to the arsenal that he has had before. There's actually less vertical movement on the four seam fastball than there was um, in previous years. His velocity on the four seam fastball was pretty much in line with. 2021 and and 2022, even though he only made two starts in 2022 before getting hurt. Um, Point being, I think this is still a guy who could post a mid threes ERA with a really mediocre strikeout rate on a good team. And so I think that type of pitcher is kind of dependent on what you need and what, and what leagues you're in, right? Like if I'm getting a 350 ERA, but I'm getting just a 20% strikeout rate, 21% strikeout rate. We're talking about like 8K per nine. Um, th- that's not like, that can be helpful, obviously, but it is not somebody I have to pitch every single week. Um, and so like, I-, I love the the ballpark context. I love the team context. He'll-, he'll steal some wins if he can go deep enough into games, but also can he go deep enough into games? Right, like he has thrown 31 total innings since 2021. So, if he matters a lot to the Orioles, they're gonna have to figure out how to get him through the season. I don't know if they're gonna let him go seven innings every single time. Um, I don't know if they're if he can last a whole the rest of the year in the rotation if he goes six or seven innings at a time. So, all of that makes me say, I like what he did. I think he's a solid pitcher, but he's not somebody that I've ever been like, I think John Means is really good. And so if he looks like the pitcher he was in the past, I think you calibrate that based on your belief in John Means in prior years. All fair points. I, I think I'm just at a point where the circle of trust is so is, is becoming such a narrow circle of trust for me these yeah. days. You say like you can't be sure how often he'll go seven innings. I that's almost the entire league for me, right? How many sure. how, how I, many pitchers grab the ball and you're like, oh, I'm getting seven innings today? No, you know? I meant, but I meant more like one of the big factors of an Orioles pitcher is like, hey, I'm going to get wins because it's a yeah. really good team. But you need to go deeper into games to get wins. If he becomes a guy who kind of settles around five innings because he's on an innings mm-hmm. limit, that makes it harder to say, I know I'm going to get wins. And you know you're not really, or I believe, you're not really going to get consistent strikeout totals here. So then he's a ratio and wins play. And if the wins become Mm -hmm. trickier, he's a ratios play. And that's why I I think I did say, like, I do think you add him in all league types. I'm just not sure. Like I wasn't super aggressive in my bidding last Mm -hmm. night. Like I, I was way more aggressive on taking Christian Scott. Like if you're comparing those two, they were like the two of the bigger bids on Sunday night. Um, I was way more aggressive on Christian Scott because I think the upside is higher than what I'm mm-hmm. getting for John Means. I agree with that. Follow the strikeouts when you can, and also just follow the the player who has the recent resume of health, which means doesn't have at least chasing wins on a good team has just become such a less valuable strategy now because, as you said, guys just don't pitch as deep. But at least on this Orioles team, if means can just get the five or six innings, there's going to be so many days where they score nine runs and he mm-hmm. wins the game anyway. And the upcoming schedule plays nicely. He gets Arizona with a team. You know, when is Corbin Carroll going to start hitting? Is he playing hurt? I'm not worried about Arizona. I think it's at Seattle. It's, it's not in Seattle, but that Seattle lineup has dead spots all through it. So I think I like means a little bit more than you do. Although I do agree with the conclusion that if you were facing a means versus a Scott debate scott would have been certainly the player i would have two-handed shove on where it means i wanted more at my price but i think i might like him maybe a little bit more than you at the end of the day uh we're gonna try to get to as many players as possible that were pickups or drops this weekend um so we'll hit those pretty quickly but before we do that with just two matches left arsenal continues their fight to stay atop the table in the Premier League when they face man U, uh manchester united at old trafford tune in this sunday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, only on Peacock. That's Arsenal versus Man U, Sunday, 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, only 
on Peacock. And the great thing about the EPL, Eric, no playoffs. The regular season is it. So for all the people who are like, oh, the playoffs are a crapshoot. I'm sick of the I best think- team not winning. In the EPL, it's it's all that matters is whoever's at the top of the table after 38 games. So you need to be on Peacock seeing what the Gunners do, if they can finally hold on to that top spot. Yeah, I will say we'll, we'll move to actual baseball stuff. But um, I like in watching Welcome to Wrexham, um, I do love that the lower levels have some teams get get promoted immediately, mm-hmm. and then some right. teams have to Relegation. battle through playoffs for yeah. for promotion. Um, just because I find that that interesting. You know, um, we're always talking about like, what if? Wouldn't it be cool if if American sports made this change or that change? There are things in in European sports they do different things. They have different formats. The whole idea of you had a lousy season, you're booted out of this league. Love that's it. great, right? That's never yeah, going to happen. The Chicago White Sox. White. I wish it would. Relegation is a beautiful thing. I I even think in fantasy, if, if you're in a league with a bunch of the same players, maybe the guy who comes in last doesn't play the next right. year. You know, um, I'm all for hybrid formats. So uh, yeah, let's let's steer in the EPL and let's watch some football this weekend. A team who isn't going to get relegated um, is the Oakland A's, who no, are not bad. Surprisingly, they're 17 and, and 18 on the season. Uh, three of their players popped. Uh, three of their hitters popped as being really hot over the last week. Um, I'm curious if you have interest in any of these guys. I'm just going to say who they are and what their stats were over the last week. And you can tell me if you think it's just a, a hot week or you'd pick them up in certain formats. Uh, Brent Rooker over the last week um, in five games was 17 of 16 at the plate. That's a 438 batting average. He had three home runs, six runs scored, seven RBIs, and a steal. Um, J.J. Blade, fellow outfielder, um, over six games played, uh, was six for 17. That's a 353 uh, batting average. Also had three home runs, also had seven RBIs, and four runs scored. And then Abraham Toro, um, who has been leading off pretty much every game for the athletics um, over six games, went nine of 22. That's a 409 batting average with one home run, seven runs scored, and four RBIs. Um, these are all guys who've probably been on and off rosters of various league types over the last few years. Do, do you think that any of them actually are interesting, or do you think it's just kind of like ride the hot bat while you can? I think they're all interesting. It's as a case with so many bad teams. The top of the lineup is interesting, and it really runs out of steam by the end of the lineup. But as you said, Toro bang leadoff, multiple position grabber. I would also mention he didn't have his best week of the season, but Tyler Nevin has settled into that yes, second yeah, spot. Yeah, for sure. He's got some pedigree. His father obviously was a major league player, so I'm interested in him. Blade may be in a platoon, left-handed hitter, so you have to work the schedule with him. And we've seen it with Rooker. High strikeout guy, high fly ball hitter. There's just going to be months at a time where he might hit 197. But at the end of the year, Brent Ricker would probably be hitting 235 with like 28 home runs. That's roster bull in any mixed league. So mm-hmm. uh, Toro, Toro, Nevin, and, and Rooker I'm proactive on. And in a deeper league, I would consider Blade too. Um, the top of this lineup is actually bona fide major league lineup. Yeah, I, I added Rooker um, in a lot of places because – I know he's a streaky hitter, and so I wasn't putting big money on him. But I will ride a I'll ride his hot bat while I can because I, I think that he does. Um, I think he he will be streaky and hit. Toro is somebody who like interested me when he was traded to Seattle um, from Houston, and there's an interesting. For me, he, he's being more aggressive overall. He's being more aggressive in the zone, but his zone contact is up so much. He's making so much more contact in the zone. The swinging strike rate has kind of plummeted again, which is, is good, obviously. We don't want guys who swing and miss. Um, to me, it he's using the whole field. He's pulling the ball way less than he has in the past. Um, he is hitting the ball in the air a lot, which is kind of like if you're not pulling the ball, and you're hitting it in the air, it doesn't seem to be great. But again, he's shooting the gaps. He's not like hitting for over-the-fence power. Um, and so in deeper formats, I can see that being of interest at, at the top of the lineup for sure. Another thing nice about this team is because they're not a glamour team, you might be surprised that you can probably get them at maybe 70 or 80% of their fab worth just because they're such an unglamorous team. Yeah. Um, one of the best hitters in baseball over the last week has been one of the better hitters for the year. And I keep telling people every weekend to pick up Luis Garcia of the Washington Nationals. He is he keeps his roster rate keeps dropping on Yahoo. He's now down under 20 percent um, over the last week. Luis Garcia in five games was nine of 16. That's a 536 average 
with four runs scored, two home runs, nine RBIs, one stolen base. This is a kid who's about to turn 24, is just 23 years old. He is making, uh, he has a 10.3% barrel rate. He's pulling the ball more. He's making way more hard contact. His EV50, which is a stat that we talked about last year, is his average exit velocity on the top 50% of his batted balls, is 54th in all of baseball. Um, at 101.8 miles an hour. This is a guy who's making a lot of contact. Um, his approach has changed at the plate. He is expanding the zone and being more aggressive. But because he's an elite contact hitter, we've talked about this in the past, I don't care if he's chasing a little bit more outside of the zone because he's chasing pitches he can make contact with and he's driving them opposite field for doubles. His line drive rate is is way up. So he's not a, power, a traditional power hitter. So I don't care if he's expanding the zone because he's expanding the zone enough to let his elite contact skills do work for him. He's now hitting third in the Nationals lineup regularly. Like I think we could look up at the end of the year and he's hitting 280 with 15 homers and 15 steals and you know solid enough counting stats in the middle of that order. And to me that's a middle infield option in pretty much all league types. I'll sign off on everything you said with just one caveat. He's not playing against left-handed pitching. So you have to work the schedule a little bit. But this week they face five righties, and I think it's eight of the next nine Miami opponents are going to be right-handed. If I were the – I'm sorry, the the uh, the, the um, Nationals, of course, not the Marlins. If I were the Nationals, okay, and, and they're, again, they're kind of like a little bit like Oakland, right? We're just happy that they're plucky. They're around 500. Cal Finnegan seems like it saves every one of their wins. Hunter Havers had a really nice season. Glimpses of what Mackenzie Gore can be. Why not just let Garcia play all the time and give him a chance yeah. to get better against left-handed pitching? I don't understand platooning a guy I, like that, but I was just gonna say I, I think they might, right? Like if he keeps hitting like this, mm -hmm. why 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 would they keep platooning him? Um, and I understand that's total speculation on my part, but I'm just suggesting I think it could I think it could happen in the coming weeks that we start to see him get yeah, this. Yeah, it's it's just one of those things that you have to look at. Now look. We know the rules with platoons, right? If you're on the strong side of the platoon, it's really not that big of a deal. And even the games he doesn't start, invariably they go to the bullpen. A righty comes in, he's back into the game. So he may get two or three at-bats in those games anyway. And as we've, we always talk about, starting pitchers with few exceptions don't last that long anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be, the whole game used to be in baseball. How quickly can we get the starter out so we can attack the bullpen? Now it's like, hey, let's make hay against the starter because right. you know, this team might have three or four bullpen guys we can't hit. So the game is kind of flipped in the approach of that. But I'm with you on Garcia. I just like to see him play a little bit more, but that won't be a problem for like the next 10 days anyway. That's my hope, at least. Um, another middle infield option for you is Royals second baseman uh, Michael Massey, mm -hmm. yeah. who over the last week in six him. games – uh, nine for 24. That's a 350, a 375, sorry, batting average with four runs scored, two home runs, and seven RBIs. Uh, Massey got a late start to the year. Um, he was on the IL in 14 games since coming off the IL. He is hitting 292. Um, has always been like a really high, uh, a, a solid contact hitter. Uh, had 15 home runs last year, so was kind of showing some sneaky pop. Um, and since coming up is pulling the ball more than last year. So maybe trying to get to a little bit of that power. Um, I have Massey already in some deep leagues. So I, I fully sign off on like, this is a, this is a, I think a more talented hitter than we, than we believe who is hitting, um, you know, fifth in a Royals lineup, like hitting, I know we don't look at the Royals lineup and we're like, hey, they're really good, even though they heading into this weekend were leading baseball in run differential. And you're still hitting behind Michael Garcia, Bobby Witt, Vinny Pascontino, and Salvador Perez, which is going to get you RBI opportunities. A fascinating team. My, my friend Joe Sheehan was writing about them. And one of the big stories about the Royals is that their production with men on base has been absurd. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote about today for Yahoo that Salvador Perez basically is – is like the best player in the league when runners are on base. And I, I don't know how sustainable that is, but maybe this is a team we talked a lot about where there's some sleeping giants in the AL Central. I thought maybe it was the Tigers, and I don't think the Tigers are a bad team, but I think I probably sold the Royals short a little bit. And, and Massey, I know you liked him the last time we mentioned him. You were more pro Massey than I was. I feel like that's a little bit of a mistake on my part. I've since rectified that with some middle infield uh, injuries that I'm facing. Again, he may m not play every time against left-handed opponents, but this is 
All I'm asking is for the Royals lineup to be average, maybe even a little bit above average. It's been must, much better than that through five weeks. But, you know, with Garcia, I think improving his profile, we know Witt is a future star. I think Salvador Perez at this point has to be seen as a possible Hall of Famer. Pasquantino healthy again. He fits nicely in the middle of this lineup. I don't know that it goes nine deep, but the first five right. or six guys in this lineup can hit. So, yeah, I, I think I'm taking the L on Kansas City. I was late to this. I was late to Massey, but thankfully in TGFBI where I'm – my bench is everybody on the, on the injured list. I was happy to – I think Michael Massey was my Trey Turner replacement in the middle infield. So uh, welcome to the club, Michael Massey. I'm in. Yeah, let's talk about some other Trey Turner replacements. Um, over the last week, we'll just look at guys who are stealing a lot of bases. Mm -hmm. um, Jose Caballero leads baseball with four steals over the last week. They all happened uh, yesterday against the Mets. Um, but we also know that Caballero can run. Um, he's been running pretty consistently for um, the Diamondbacks. There said the Diamondbacks. Uh, I was going to say the Devil Rays, and then uh, that that's not their team name anymore. But he's been running pretty consistently for the Rays this year. He already has 13 steals. Um, some guy, he's just only 50% rostered in the Yahoo format, so you can find him in a lot of leagues. Um, Willie Castro, who you kind of banged the drum for before, um, has had or has been really hot over the last two weeks, so he's been picked up a lot of places, but still is just 60% rostered, so you can find him in places. He has three steals over the last week. Uh, Jacob Young, um, if you have an outfield spot available, um, is rostered in just 51% of Yahoo leagues. He has uh, three steals over the last week. Um, and then another name, if you like, want somebody who's rostered in technically zero Yahoo leagues, <laughs> um, Cole Tucker has been called up by the Angels. Um, he's 5 of 12, which is a 417 average um, since coming up. He has three steals. Um, over that time as well. That's just five games and only one start. Um, but, you know, Cole Tucker was a prospect of some note um, in years past. He is still uh, just 27 years old. He can play the outfield. He can play, you know, the infield. So there's a chance that he settles in as kind of like a super util type player for the Angels, and they're running like crazy. Um, and so, again, like if you're in a real deep format, that's a name to keep an eye on um, if you want potential steals yeah again i'm gonna bang the table for willie castro with byron buxton getting hurt which i don't mean to be glib about it but i mean we all kind of expected buxton's not a six-month player the twins have so many injury candidates on that team and castro not that he's a great defender but he's adequate basically he, he can basically play anywhere on the field so anybody gets hurt lewis gets hurt he's their third baseman buxton gets hurt he's in the outfield and he, what, he still like 35 bases last year or something like that. I know he's a free swinger. He'll swing at almost anything, but I can see him at least hitting for a plausible batting average with some power, with some mm -hmm. speed. The Twins had that 12-game winning streak. A lot of it's schedule-based. Finally snapped on Sunday against the Red Sox, but they've been playing well as now, well of late. So Willie Castro is a guy I'm really excited to have. And um, I, I think – it's funny. He was dropped in a league. He was dropped in labor the previous week. And I spent the whole week thinking, okay, I just hope Willie Castro doesn't go ballistic. So I have to bid a ton on him. I'd like to sneak him onto my roster as opposed to elbow people out of the way for uh, Willie Castro. And that's another team I have that has a bunch of injuries. I ended up spending $11 of my 100 fab to get Castro. So that's how much I like him. He's already on a bunch of my other teams. I am all in on Willie Castro. Nice. Um, I want to highlight two pitchers who've been really good over the last week. Um, I mentioned before that Dean Kramer carved up the Reds. Well, uh, Dean Kramer in his last two starts has just a 138 ERA and a 077 whip. Um, he has 10 strikeouts over the 13 innings in those two starts. Um, and obviously, you know, we know that the Orioles are going to give him a better chance at wins. Those two starts are also against the Yankees and the Reds. So it's not like they were gimme. Um, matchups. I think that Kramer is somebody who should be picked up in all like 15 plus team leagues and held on to because he made some interesting changes in the second half last year and that's carried over. Um, and I would add him even in certain um, 12 team leagues, uh, you know, depending on, on your pitching depth. And then also Garrett Crochet, who I advise people to hold on to because I, I really think that, you know, even though he might not be the, oh my God, I won my league because I picked up Garrett Crochet type of player that everybody thought he was after like three starts. He also was getting really unlucky in the starts that he was getting kind of like hammered. And there's still an interesting pitcher in there who was making the transition from reliever to starter. So it wasn't going to all like go smoothly the whole time. 
Over his last two starts, Crochet has a 2.45 ERA, 0.55 WHIP, and 13 Ks over 11 innings. Um, he's somebody that, like, I would just, I would actually keep him on my roster in 12 team leagues, and maybe I don't start him every game, but I, I don't think he should be being cut. Yeah, that's the key with Crochet. You need to be able, the ability to pick and choose the matchups. And I'm with you on Kramer. I like the changes he made in the second half last year. Any exposure to the Orioles lineup looks good to me. And Usually with Kramer, it's like, well, he's not a great strikeout guy, but at least doesn't walk anybody. What if the strikeouts get ticked up a lot? Then, then mm -hmm. this is somebody who I would not at all be surprised. And, I, and maybe I'm just making it too easy a hit, but I could easily see Dean Kramer being a top 50 pitcher the rest of the way. Yeah, I, I agree there. Um, I mean, that's bold, but I can see it. I do think it's like in the range of outcomes. Uh, lastly, mm -hmm. on um, players that I wanted to talk about, I guess this actually will transition us um, a little bit to players who are concerning. He's one of the guys who was like, a, and I'm going to call people losers, but he was one of the guys who had a concerning stretch recently. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason Foley of the Tigers has allowed four runs over his last two and two thirds innings. Perhaps more interestingly, he hasn't thrown a sinker over a hundred miles an hour since April 4th. Um, that's over his last 11 outings. That was like a really big thing for him in his first few outings is the, the velocity increase. Um, his average velocity dipped to 97 and it was actually below 97 in his last performance. It was at 96.5. Um, meanwhile, Alex Lang has looked actually really good again in the Tigers bullpen. Um, and we might be getting back into like a crazy mix of Alex Lang, Jason Foley, Shelby Miller, um at the back of that rotation uh, i would be picking up lang where i could just to see how this plays out because he's pitching the best of the three right now he is although nine walks and 16 strikeouts I, he, he's a heart attack uh, lately yes foley's been a heart attack I, I was at uh, a local restaurant hanging out with my buddy dean great bartender madison heights outback and watching trying to enjoy my steak and watching foley blow a save against the yankees where it's a like rocket Bunt single, rocket, rocket, game over. And, and I have a lot of Foley. It, it's really disheartening when you have a closer on a bunch of teams and then you watch him blow a save. He doesn't miss any bats. He doesn't get anybody out. Infinity whip. And it's like, okay, it's going to hurt every one of my teams, as it feels like. But I really like A.J. Hinch as a manager. The Tigers are two games over 500. We, we know that division. It's not going to be the White Sox. But I think any of the other four teams are in play. So... I don't think Hinch is going to give anybody a long leash. We saw them basically mm -hmm. cut, cut the court on Lang as a closer when the season started. But I can see their next save going to Lang, going to Miller, going to Foley, going to matchups. I can, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if any of these – like if the game was in the balance on the seventh inning and any of those three guys came in, even Andrew Chafin, if the situation called for a lefty, the only thing that makes me nervous is these guys are all walking. Even, even Chafin has six walks in 12 in the yeah. third innings. So I will say you mentioned Lang. Lang has two walks in his last eight appearances. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah. we you don't Front know. Loaded. I mean, yep. he's done that in the past where he seems to have gotten the control in check and then it, it leaves him. But it is if he has settled into a little bit more of a groove there, I, I do think that makes him the interesting. Here's my my big takeaway, and I hate saying this because I have a, a fair amount of Foley. I don't think Jason Foley like ends the season with 25 saves. I think this, there's going to be sea changes here. It could be a committee. And, and a lot of times when people say committee, what that means is we're just looking for somebody to reel off two or three saves, and then he runs with it. Like when, when Foley got that opening day save, I think at the time, Hinch was like, okay, well, let's start committee style, but if Foley gets some traction, we'll go to him. And that's kind of what they've done. But I think eventually, end of the season, Miller may have eight to 10 saves. Lang could, could easily have 12 to 15 saves. Maybe Foley's around that. I, I'm just afraid mm -hmm. it's going to be two or three headed. At least you have a good manager. At least you have a decent team. The Tigers aren't 90 wins decent, but they're going to be at least around 500. I think maybe a little bit better than that. I'm just afraid that I'm not sure there's one right answer here. But this is here's the bottom line. They get a lead late in the game. you got to be watching the game and see who's warming. Even if guys yeah. don't come in, who's warming up? Where is Hinch looking? How is he handling the high leverage situations? Who's pitching against the best part of an opponent lineup? That's mm -hmm. another part of the thing that was frustrating with Foley on that save chances. He had to face all the good hitters in the Yankee lineup, and of course, he couldn't get any of them out. It really hurt that Verdugo placed a perfect bunt that was ostensibly meant as a sacrifice, and it turned into a bunt single. But there's something is going to change here, and I don't think I can trade Foley's nine saves right now, but I wish that I could. Yeah. Um, 
there are some other pitchers or players that we should be concerned about. We'll get to them in just one second. First, the road to the Indianapolis 500 later this month continues this Saturday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time with the Indy Grand Prix on NBC and Peacock. Find out who takes the checkered flag at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Road Course. That's this Saturday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on NBC and Peacock. Um, so real quick, Scott, I wanted to just go over the players who are most dropped uh, on Yahoo, in Yahoo leagues um, and just have you say, we'll say yay or nay, as in we support the drop or we don't. Uh, the most dropped player uh, on Yahoo formats is, um, is Alec Manoa. Um, I kind of don't even really know why he was picked up. So I, I support dropping him. I, I kind of hope and I assume you do as well. Yes, plus you can drop all the Maple Leafs after they are eliminated by the Bruins in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Boom. There's Scott coming in with some hockey. Um, we'll skip over the, the – there's a lot of pitchers who were dropped who were just streamed for this week, like mm -hmm. you know Bailey Falter, Cooper Criswell, guys like that. Um, Wyatt Lankford is the most dropped hitter in Yahoo formats. Um, he's We know he's going to be sidelined for a month right now with his injury, um, and – there's really no guarantee that he comes back and is immediately back in the Rangers. Like mm -hmm. he could get a really long rehab stint. He could come back and get options. So I, I understand like if I have an IL spot, I'll put him in the IL spot, but I understand people with an IL crunch or like an NFBC formats, even just cutting bait on Wyatt Langford. Okay. Sign as well. It's been a heavy injury season. He's off to a slow start. It's a deep roster. I don't think we can, he's going to be a great player someday. Maybe it's just not going to be in 2024. Yep, we met, kind of had that conversation with Jackson Holiday before. Um, the second most dropped hitter is Joey Loperfito, um, which I found interesting. It's only been five games. Yes, he has seven strikeouts and just one walk in five games. He's hitting 267. He hasn't yet hit a home run. Um, however, the Astros are playing him often. Um, he's not playing. He didn't play against his first lefty, but he started five of the six games that he's been up. I personally think it's too early to be moving on from low Perfido, although I do think it's important to see that John Singleton is playing first base still. Low Perfido is in the outfield uh, where that spot was vacated by Chaz McCormick. So it's not like low Perfido is taking the Jose Abreu spot. Um, Singleton is currently taking that spot, but I don't I. I don't know why we've given up on low Perfido after five games. Yeah, I think it's more people believe in Singleton, who was one of those signed the early deal, buy out the arbitration. What's the player mm -hmm. doing? He's giving up so much money, and then Singleton ended up not being good for a lot of different reasons. Still just 32, 121 OPS plus, and he's getting the coveted Abreu spot, right? I mean, McCormick's hurt. He's been terrible, but he'll come back and eventually play again. I just feel like with Singleton outperforming Lo Perfido, as be it, it's a small sample. I get it. They did go to Singleton before Lo Perfido, but I feel like he has more traction in this lineup, more yeah. security. So Singleton's been been the guy that I've I've gravitated towards. I was a little bit late on him, but I still did get some shares. I just don't know that Lo Perfido is guaranteed anything past another week or so. Yeah, and I agree on Singleton. I mean, eight point two percent barrel rate. Um, he is pulling the. He's making a lot of contact. Um, he has a ninety percent zone contact rate, eighty one percent contact overall. Not swinging and missing. Um, he is. You know, it's a similar profile to what he did last year. Mm -hmm. um, he's not pulling the ball a ton. He is hitting it in the air a lot, but in the air to like center field. I don't really know like what kind of crazy power you're going to get out of him. Um, you know, he may be a 250, 260 hitter who gives you 15 homers. And it, you know, to me, it's like I get putting him in there, but I'm not stoked on the upside. I'll give you my hot take. I think I've said it before on the show. They're not making the playoffs. No. Oh, you you don't think they're making the playoffs at all? Interesting. Nope. Um, yeah, I still I still have some faith, but you know, I don't want to call it faith. I still have some belief in the organization, but maybe it's um, you know, not rightly placed um another hitter we don't have to talk about but uh, brenton doyle was the third most dropped hitter i don't understand why we're dropping rockies hitters when they're going to get every single game at coors field just a reminder to please check that schedule when you drop hitters and if you're planning on dropping a rockies hitter just probably unless they're injured probably wait a week um and make sure that they're you're not dropping them before they're going to get every single game at coors field last question um i will give to you there are a lot of pitchers um, who we know by name, who were dropped. Um, 
and like Reed Detmers was the fourth most dropped pitcher in Yahoo formats. Luis Severino right after him. Uh, Mackenzie Gore right after him in that way. Is that something in like a 12 team league? You look at like those guys are kind of, you know, my fringe pitchers. And so if they're not running hot right now, I'm happy to move on because I assume I'll find somebody on the waiver wire. Yeah, I have some Mackenzie Gore shares where I've been thinking about dropping him, but I haven't done it yet. Severino's a hard guy for me to trust, but I still think Detmer, Detmers and Gore are good enough to be rostered in the 12 team formats. I agree with you. I, I like the idea of saying, hey, this is my worst two starting pitcher spots in a 12 team league. And I will churn them if I don't like what I'm seeing or if there's somebody who comes along the way. I, I have said all season I don't trust what Severino's doing, even though the results were there. Um, you know, Detmers and, and Gore and even, honestly, to a lesser extent, like Eric Fetty, who was dropped alongside of them, who has been pitching pretty well of late. Like, I could see holding guys like that on your bench unless somebody like Christian Scott comes along. Um, but so, yeah, I, I try and I try and churn the bottom of my roster but if they're pitchers with upside i really like um i i would keep detmers and gore for a couple more starts just to see if they can right the ship a little bit uh that'll do it for a long episode of us lots of news and notes to talk about uh you can find us on twitter i am at samsky nyc scott is at scott underscore pianowski um and we'll do a kind of a pulse check on the league on wednesday look at some of the offenses that we should be targeting now um some of the pitching staffs that are maybe pitching better than years past some of the calls we made at the start of the season that have not panned out or have panned out um and we'll kind of see where we go from here uh, so we'll see you on Wednesday for another episode of the Roto-World Baseball Show.